Hello. Today we're talking about civil law and uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between civil and criminal law and then we're going to spend a little time talking about the different types of civil cases. So it's really important to understand the difference between a civil case and a criminal case. Um, the manner in which cases move through the legal system varies depending on whether the case is civil or criminal. The rights and obligations of various parties vary a lot based on whether a case is civil or criminal. And indeed, the, the ultimate standard of proof that the moving party has to achieve varies depending on whether the case is civil or criminal, as, can, as, as does the outcome. So it's usually easiest to start by looking at criminal cases. And I know that seems weird since we're starting with civil law, but looking at the criminal justice system very, very briefly, just as a point of distinction from the civil justice system, I, I think is helpful. So a criminal case always involves the violation of a criminal statute. Um, criminal law has to be written down. It has to be statutory. It cannot be common law. So you can't have sort of a general understanding, social norm type thing that gives rise to a criminal prosecution. Criminal prosecutions have to be based on violation of very explicit, very clear laws that outline exactly the elements that the state has to prove in order to convict you of a crime. And that right there is one of the defining characteristics of a criminal case. In a criminal case, the state is always the moving party. It's always the state versus Joe or the state versus Smith Corp. Uh, uh, you can actually have a criminal prosecution against a corporation or a foundation, but ultimately the aggrieved party, the party that is hurt and is seeking redress in the courts is always the state. And by state here, I mean government. Um, it could, of course, be a county government or a city government or the federal government, but we're always talking about the government. So it'll be Texas versus Jones or U.S. versus Jones. In contrast, civil law is much broader. Uh, there are definitely civil statutes that define people's rights and obligations to one another, but there's also this whole body of common law and constitutional law and a host of other sort of sources of law that give rise to civil actions. In a civil action, the party that is hurt, the party that is going to the court and asking for help is called the plaintiff. And the party that did the bad thing, <laughs> that violated the rule, violated the norm, etc., is the defendant. The plaintiff or the defendant can be an individual, it can be a corporation, or it can be a government entity. So, for example, the United States can act as a civil plaintiff as well as a prosecuting authority. Similarly, you can actually sue the government, sue the U.S. government, and in that case, the U.S. government would be a defendant in a civil action. The state is never a criminal defendant. Another way in which criminal cases and civil cases vary is with respect to what we call the burden of proof. So the party that is seeking redress from the court, the party that instigates the action, always has the burden of proving its case. In order to win, it has to, that party has to meet a particular standard of evidence or uh, convince you to a certain degree. In the case of criminal prosecutions, the state always has to prove that you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. 
Um, and you've probably heard that on Law and Order or some other uh, law-related show. We're very familiar with this idea of beyond a reasonable doubt. And we'll talk later in the semester about what exactly that means, but it's a very high burden. The state has to prove that you are almost certainly guilty in order to convict you. In a civil case, the most common burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. All, what that means is that in order to win, the plaintiff just has to show that it's more likely than not that they are correct, that they are telling the truth, that they have the adequate evidence to prove their case. So um, one example that sort of demonstrates this difference of the burden of proof is the O.J. Simpson case. Um, many years ago, in the early 1990s, O.J. Simpson was accused of killing his ex-wife, Nicole, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. And there was a pretty massive uh, criminal trial. It was broadcast on TV. It was a big deal, and it lasted a very long time. And ultimately, the jury acquitted O.J. Simpson of the murder. So he was, he was found not guilty. Nevertheless, the families of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman brought a civil suit against O.J. Simpson. And instead of proving that he killed, that it was beyond a reasonable doubt that O.J. Simpson killed these people, the, uh, the families of the victims all they had to do was show that it was more likely than not that O.J. Simpson killed them. And uh, they were able to meet that burden and they received money damages for, uh, for a type of lawsuit we call wrongful death. In the criminal context, we talk about whether someone is guilty or not guilty. And that implies a certain sort of moral um, responsibility that you're, you know, you're guilty. There's something bad about being guilty. In the civil context, we don't use those terms. We don't say that somebody is guilty uh, in a car accident, right? We don't. That's not how we deal with it. Instead, we talk about whether they are liable or not liable. Are you responsible or not responsible? It's a, it's a subtle difference, but it's really important in the way that we understand the nature of criminal, or of, I'm sorry, of civil responsibility. It doesn't carry the same weight of um, moral condemnation that a criminal conviction does. In the criminal context, if you're found guilty, if, if the defendant loses, the defendant will be punished. And that can mean... Uh, the imposition of a fine, and so you have to pay money in order to sort of pay penance, um, or it could be the loss of liberty by serving time in jail or serving time on probation, um, or it can even result in the loss of life if uh, you happen to live in a death penalty state. In the civil context, the issue is not punishment. Again, there's, we don't have this sort of sense of moral wrong in a civil case. Instead, um, the issue is what we call damages. So if I am wronged um, through a breach of contract, for example, and I sue the other party to the contract and I win, they have to pay me money. They have to make me whole. But they don't have, but we're rarely going to impose any sort of punishment. There's a little bit of an exception there for something called punitive damages. Um, sometimes we want to make them hurt just a little bit to uh, dissuade them from engaging in that same behavior in the future. But there are only a fairly small number of civil actions that allow for punitive damages. And it's still always money, not imprisonment. Because the stakes in criminal law are so high, you actually have a constitutional right to an attorney if you are a criminal defendant. Um, if you have been prosecuted by the state and you can't afford to hire your own attorney, the state is obligated to provide one for you. In the civil context, 
you have no right to an attorney. So even if somebody sues you and you are broke, you can't afford to hire a lawyer, you just have to represent yourself. You don't have, uh, you don't have any right to legal representation. Nobody's going to pay for that for you. Similarly, in the criminal context, you have a constitutional right to not testify against yourself. Uh, we call that the privilege against self-incrimination. We talk about it in the Miranda warnings, that you have the right to remain silent. And in fact, most criminal defendants choose not to testify in their trials. They instead choose to remain silent. In the civil context, you do not have the right to remain silent. So unless you are afraid of a criminal conviction or a criminal prosecution, you have to answer all of the questions that are put to you, even if it hurts your position. Um, so again, we provide significantly more protection to criminal defendants than we do to civil defendants. Within the broad world of civil law, it's sometimes helpful to break down cases and categorize them a bit. Um, one of the most common forms of civil litigation is uh, what we call a breach of contract. A contract is an explicit agreement. It doesn't have to be written, but it does have to be explicit between two parties. So for example, if I hire somebody to cut my grass, and they, I say, I'll pay you $20 to cut my, my grass, to, to mow my lawn, and they mow my lawn, I have to pay them the $20. We have an agreement. We talked about that. If they just show up and mow my lawn in the middle of the night and then say, hey, you should pay me $20 because I did a good thing for you, I don't owe them anything because we didn't have an explicit agreement. The uh, the one that tends to get people is an area of civil law known as torts, right? Which is a weird word, but basically what torts are are breaches of unwritten rules or unspoken rules. For example, um, if I go to the doctor to have surgery and the surgeon comes in and talks to me about what he's going to do. You know, he's going to make an incision. He's going to remove my appendix. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that he's not allowed to leave a retractor in my body, right? That he's not allowed to leave a, a medical instrument in my body. Instead, it is understood that as a doctor, he has to behave like a reasonable doctor. He has to live up to a certain standard of care. And if he doesn't, I can sue for medical malpractice. Similarly, let's say I get in a car accident down on the, the square in downtown Denton. I rear end somebody. It's a person I've never met before. We did not have an agreement that I wouldn't hit his car. Right? We never talked about that. Um, we certainly didn't have a written agreement. But the fact that we are on the road together assumes that we will both behave in a reasonable manner. We will not be negligent in the way that we drive. And if I am negligent in the way I operate my car, and as a result, he is hurt, right, either through the loss of, of damage to his property or if he's physically injured, if I'm negligent and I cause him harm, he can sue me for negligence. So uh, we'll look at the difference between contracts and torts again in just a second. But the other three broad categories of civil law are property law, which deals, as it sounds, uh, sounds like, with the rights and obligations that you have as a property owner. Um, typically, we're talking about real property, which is like land and houses, um, but it also includes property like cars. Uh, for example, if I park my car in a, um, in a parking garage or I hand the key over to a valet, that creates something called a bailment, which is a fancy term for saying that person is now responsible for my car. And if they wreck it, then I can sue. I have a property interest in my car. Um, 
The next type of law is what we call the law of succession. This has to do with how we pass property on from one person to the next upon death. Um, so this involves wills, but it also involves rules about how we pass on property when there is no will. Uh, we say that somebody dies intestate. They don't have a will. They haven't specified who gets their house. So there are rules that we have to deal with that, and that is part of the law of succession. And finally, the last category of, of civil law that is incredibly important in our society is family law. And this is the law that deals with the obligations that you have when you enter into a marriage or when you dissolve a marriage. It also includes the obligations and benefits that you get from domestic partnerships. Um, so there are some uh, relationships that are different from marriage that are nevertheless recognized by the state. Um, and it includes things like child custody as well. So I want to go back for just a minute to this issue of the difference between a contract, an explicit agreement, and a tort, which is the violation of a social norm or an expectation of behavior. Uh, and I want to talk about a case that every first year law student reads. It's a case called Hawkins versus McGee. Um, it is sometimes known as the Hairy Hand case, and you will see why in just a second. Um, so the case is from 1929. It's a New Hampshire uh, state court case. It was not before the US Supreme Court. Uh, but it's a really interesting case. So young Mr. Hawkins was a, a, a preteen, right? I think he was like nine or 10. And he had an accident on his family's farm and he damaged his hand very, very badly. Um, he had serious scarring on his hand and he, he basically lost the use of it. And this was super problematic, of course, because he was uh, you know, a farmer. Um, he was going to probably inherit his family's farm someday and this was going to make it much more difficult for him to earn a living. So McGee is a doctor and McGee has learned about this new procedure, brand new procedure called a skin graft. And so when Hawkins and his parents go to Dr. McGee, they say, we, we need to help our son. And McGee says, I've got it. We're going to do this thing called a skin graft. And I guarantee you, he will have a 100% hand when this is over. Those were his words, a 100% hand. So the doctor performs a skin graft on this young man. And he removes, uh, he takes skin, I believe, from the young man's thigh and uh, grafts it onto his hand. And um, the young man does, in fact, uh, regain significant use of his hand. But in the grafting procedure, the doctor went a little deep in taking uh, the skin and he actually took the hair follicles. And so the hair follicles from this young man's leg have now been grafted onto his hand. And when he goes through puberty and he starts to develop body hair, he develops hair on his hand. And so he sues. <laughs> And he sues on two grounds. He sues for breach of contract, and he sues for negligence, for medical malpractice. So the court has to decide whether it's possible for this young man to recover under either of these theories. And with respect to the tort, with respect to the medical malpractice claim, what the court says is that there is no standard of care for a skin graft because it's a brand new procedure. We can't say that a reasonable doctor performing a skin graft would have done it differently because we don't know how skin grafts are performed. It was a brand new procedure. There were no standards. There were no rules. So there's no way for the young man to recover under a theory of tort, 
right, under sort of a standard of reasonableness. But the doctor made a terrible mistake. When he agreed to treat this young man, he said, I guarantee you a 100% hand. That created a contract. And so even though there was no standard for the quality of a skin graft, and the young man cannot sue for a tort, he can sue for breach of contract because a hairy hand is not a 100% hand.